Greetings, welcome to this time of worship. If you look out the windows, there's a new batch of different kinds of flowers blooming today, so the colors have changed out there. I appreciate those who have taken care of the garden, who instituted and have cared for it in the long run. Today is Sunday, August 6th, 2023. It's the 10th Sunday after Pentecost proper 13 in our cycle. And I'll have you look at the cover of the bulletin. There is a mosaic floor that, um, there are mosaic floors all over the Middle East and on, on into, and into Rome. I was on a study tour, golly, two decades ago, and got to see some of these. It's pretty amazing what people chose to put in their homes, to, to have on their floors, to remind them of their faith. Um, we stayed in for a while in a, in a intentionally diverse community, Neve Shalom, and their symbol is um, this necklace I'm wearing. It's a fish and a grain stalk. So loaves and fishes are gonna come into our story a little bit later today. The community is 10 Muslim families and 10 Jewish families and some Christian families in there together. And the kids all go to school together. They, the people work together. When there's a Christian holiday and the Christian kids are out of school, then the other kids are learning about that holiday. They try to learn some of each other's languages. They live together intentionally in peace. Nebe Shalom means place of peace. And the families are rotated in and out after so much time so that others can have the experience. But it was a wonderful, just beautiful, relaxing place to be, um, to think about the peace that is there, the calm that is there, and the intentionality of bringing that to the people. So that's our loaves and fishes introduction. The cover art on the back is a rather stylized version of Jacob wrestling with somebody. The scriptures say a man, but the person talks like and responds like God or an angel of God. And so maybe that's partly what um, Jacob is wrestling with. How could anybody be greater than he and besting him at this wrestling thing? So maybe he didn't want to admit that it was God. Police just drove up with lights and sirens. <laughs> They drove in and they're driving out, I hope. Okay, well, if they come knocking on the door, we'll, we'll help them. So Jacob wrestling with <clears throat> somebody and loaves and fishes is our story today, our, our stories today. We begin with the one about Jacob. And it's a scripture before I technically do the call to worship, but we're here. You've answered a call this morning to be here. So let us move on. Um, we know that whoever we are and wherever we are, God is with us. And that's what Jacob's learning all along this trip is that wherever he is, God's with him, which is comforting but God's with him, and God knows what he's been up to, and God knows the naughty things that he has done in his life. And sometimes we struggle to escape. There are some people who, who suggest that God, <clears throat> there's an Old Testament God and a New Testament God, when we know that God really didn't change from one season to the next. Um, but often when they say God is the Old Testament God, it's about control and about judgment and about punishment for not following the rules. And if you read carefully, that's not all that God does in the Old Testament. The Lord is my shepherd. He makes me lie down in green pastures, restores my soul. That's not judgmental or punishing. But sometimes that's what people get stuck in their minds and maybe that's what Jacob is wrestling with internally anyway, as he's making this particular journey. A lot of our ancestors turned away, tried to avoid God, turned away, literally, Jonah's 
God said, go to Nineveh, and Jonah said, nope, went the other way. Um, some try to hide, some go into a place of darkness where they think God can't find them. Even though I go to the depths of Sheol, you are there, says the psalmist, it's everywhere. Some outright lied, but we know that any relationship is a give and take, it's difficult. And sometimes um, living with someone else's wishes can be difficult. And here's Jacob struggling physically with a mysterious opponent, but more figuratively perhaps with his own ego. So remember that Jacob is the grandson of Abraham and Sarah. Abraham and Sarah had Isaac. Now they also had Ishmael with Sarah's maid, Hagar. So that's another whole um, group of people. That's another whole 12 tribes. Here we have um, Isaac, whose name means laughter. But there's not so much laughter in his life. He meets Rebecca, and that's good. And they together have twins, Esau and Jacob. Esau, the older, the firstborn, the one who should be in charge of the family and the, and the uh, all the property and all the money and all the people that are in his family when his father dies. Um, Jacob has stolen the birthright and Jacob has stolen the blessing of his father and Esau is understandably angry, angry enough to want to kill his brother. Always wanting to be the winner. Jacob wrestles all night long with a stranger one who will not give in, who will not give up, and who will not let him go. So Jacob is fleeing for his life. He has fleed for his life. He has fled for his life. Um, he was forced to leave his mother and all he had known and flee before his brother literally did murder him. A lot has happened since then. This is probably 20 years later. Jacob has taken two wives, Rachel and Leah, which we learned about last week. Rachel and Leah were each given a maidservant in the whole marriage contract thing. And so between Rachel and Leah and the two maidservants, there are now 11 children in the family. And there's a lot of wealth. A tricky Jacob as he was living with um, Laban, his father-in-law, and the two women, um, he said, oh, don't pay me in anything, you know, money or any of that sort of thing. Just give me all the blemished lambs of the sheep or the goats that are born because only the pure white ones were good for sacrifice. And so you can imagine that the pure white ones are this many and the spotted ones, the blemished ones are this many. And so Rachel and Leah's brothers are getting quite jealous of the wealth that their brother-in-law is is amassing so they are starting to turn against him so jacob decides we need to get out of here so he's bringing his two wives the two maidservants their 11 children and much wealth and i imagine that there are more maidservants in the group as well he brings all that he has to travel back home and he is intentionally seeking out his brother from whom he's been estranged for over 20 years they left on bad terms. Jacob, obviously a cheater, and, and Esau, potentially a murderer. Decades have passed. Their families have grown in size and power, both of them. The weight of the consequences of his earlier behavior and with some strong, encouraging words from God in dreams, Jacob has decided it's time for a reconciliation. The meeting is arranged. Jacob prepares to meet his brother face to face with all kinds of precautions in place. So for more about this, you can read more of Genesis 32 and Genesis 33. I'm gonna tell you <laughs> the condensed version as we're already into it. Jacob makes sure that his family and all of his possessions are on the other side of the river so that it will take some doing if Esau is going to try to attack them as well because he doesn't know what he's going to meet. <sighs> he wants to meet his brother alone and face whatever consequences. So Esau will arrive at the meeting place tomorrow with 400 soldiers behind him. He's also got quite, quite a lot going on in his life. Messengers have been moving from brother to brother, making sure that all the preparations are made and everything is proper. And Jacob has the night alone. 
in the darkness to brood. What will the next day bring, he wonders. Well, here's what scripture tells us happens. Um, in the original version that you're probably reading in the Bible, there's a lot of he's and him's, and it's between whoever the stranger is and whoever Jacob is. So I have inserted their, their, their names, if you will, into this version. The same night, Jacob got up and took his two wives, his two maids, and his 11 children and crossed the ford of the Jabbok. He took them and sent them across the stream, and likewise, everything that he had. And Jacob was left alone, and a man wrestled with Jacob until daybreak. And when the man saw that he did not prevail against Jacob, the man struck Jacob on the hip socket, and Jacob's hip was put out of joint as Jacob wrestled with the man. Then the man said, let me go for day is breaking. So apparently Jacob still has some kind of hold over him and wants to keep going. But Jacob said, I will not let you go unless you bless me. So the man said to Jacob, what's your name? And Jacob said, Jacob. Then the man said, you shall no longer be called Jacob, but Israel. For you have striven with God and with humans and have prevailed. Maybe that's a foreshadowing of how it's going to go with his brother on the next day. Then Jacob asked him, please tell me your name. But the man said, why is it that you ask my name? And then the man blessed Jacob. So Jacob called the place Peniel, saying, for I have seen God face to face and yet my life is preserved. The sun rose up on him as he passed Penuel, limping because of his hip. So whatever picture you've had in your mind of Jacob, now becoming Israel, has to add the limp because his hip joint is out of socket. So to his surprise, he didn't have to wait until the next day for the struggle to begin. The stranger appears, the scripture uses the word man, but Jacob believes it was either an angel of God or actually God. They wrestle until dawn. The stranger has put Jacob's hip out of joint, but Jacob continues the struggle. Jacob still has breath and the need to win, so he demands to know the stranger's name. Remember, if you know someone's name, you have some power over it. You have some control over it. You can call them and they'll look and they'll respond. You can, you can put parameters around your relationship. There's a connection there. There's a relationship and power over someone. So even though he's in great pain because his hip is out of joint, Jacob insists on knowing this information. So the stranger blesses him. First, he asked for a blessing, and the stranger sort of averted that question. And now that Jacob's asking for other questions, uh, let's go back to the blessing. The name Jacob meant someone who supplants, who takes what is not his. This new name, Israel, means the one who, who has striven with God, the one who has wrestled with God. Jacob did and will struggle in many ways with God, with divine beings, with human beings. The name um, came to mean God rules as the stranger had command of the night of struggles. It's a reminder that God had complete control of the situation from the beginning. If only Jacob would remember that. So because we know that the story ends on a brighter note, because we've only got 11 sons, we don't have 12 yet, we need 12 sons of Jacob. They do meet and they do reconcile. They continue to live, though, apart from each other because there's just no place big enough for all of Esau's family and all of Jacob's family and their, their armies, their, their people. <sighs> Scripture says that Jacob bowed down many times, even as he approached his brother. It must have been painful with his new hip injury. And that same injury also means that Jacob will walk with a limp from now on. He'll be recognizable from a distance. No more sneaking up on people. People will know who he is. He will no longer be known as the undefeated one because even if he got a blessing from this man, 
God, angel, he still has an injury that will remind him every step of his life that God is with him. He has a new identity, a fresh outlook on life. He's now ready to be the leader, training up his sons, the leaders of the 12 tribes of Israel. So much for now. Let's turn in the bulletins to our call to worship. The day breaks and God does not let us go. The hour calls and God does not let us go. The evening falls and God holds us fast. Let us turn to God in worship. We turn to God who never turns from us. This next hymn is one that perhaps, at least the gist of it, Jacob might have prayed on his night of wrestling. Hymn number 470, Dear Lord and Father of Mankind. I see reflect Jacob wrestling and some of them reflect Jesus in the next story that we'll share. But will you join me now in our unison prayer of invocation? God, you see us, you see our struggles, you see our difficulties, you see our possibilities, you see our promise. Connect the dots for us, God. Soften the hard spots with your blessing. Call us in our wandering to hear you say our names. Satisfy our longings as with loaves and fishes and manna from heaven. You are a good God, a God present in the scramble. In the end, you always, always have a blessing. For this and so much more, we give you thanks through Jesus Christ. Amen. Loaves and fishes. It's an important story. Not many of the stories about Jesus' life and ministry are included in all four Gospels, but this one is, they're not all the same, but this one is included in all four Gospels. Jesus, even Jesus, needed time away to wrestle with life's problems. In the verses just before um, Matthew 14, which I'll read in a couple minutes, you'll be reminded of the death of John. John 
was the yet unborn cousin when Jesus' mother Mary went to visit her cousin Elizabeth and John leapt in her womb because he knew Jesus was there. John was the one who baptized Jesus. John was the one who sent his listeners to Jesus, telling them that he was the true Messiah. Both faithful men called followers to a new understanding of God with us. They shared meals together as family in celebration of holy days and, and other family gatherings. So the news of John the Baptist's death meant not only the death of a close friend and a relative, but it also meant that Jesus' own life was in danger. If they could take John's life, what about Jesus? And so Jesus, the scripture will tell us, withdrew from there in a boat to a deserted place by himself. He needed time to grieve. He needed time to sort out how his life was gonna be different without his unusual ally any longer. He needed time to rest and to restore himself. He needed time to remember who he was and what gifts he could bring to the people. And so let's see what scripture tells us about this day. John the Baptist has been killed. Now, when Jesus heard this, he withdrew from there in a boat to a deserted place by himself. But when the crowds heard it, they followed him on foot from the towns. When he went ashore, he saw a great crowd and he had compassion for them and cured their sick. When it was evening, the disciples came to him and said, this is a deserted place and the hour is now late. Send the crowds away so that they may go back to the villages and buy food for themselves. And Jesus said to them, they need not go away. You give them something to eat. They replied, we have nothing here but five loaves and two fish. And he said, bring them here to me. Then he ordered the crowds to sit down on the grass. Taking the five loaves and the two fish, he looked up to heaven and blessed and broke the loaves and he gave them to the disciples, and the disciples gave them to the crowds. And all ate and were filled. And they took up what was left over of the broken pieces, 12 baskets full. And those who ate were about 5,000 men besides women and children. What another amazing day the disciples are having and following Jesus. And then he was interrupted. He was called back to servanthood by the needs of the people who had gathered, trusting in his word and his power, and also grieving because they'd heard the news of John the Baptist as well. I think like each one of us, Jesus wanted some more time away, but the real world called him back to do what he was placed on earth to do. Jesus spent all day healing the sick. He had compassion for them knowing himself from his own immediate situation, just how sad and lonely and apart people can feel when their bodies or their minds are not well or at peace. Seeming to not even notice the time of day, he healed the people until late in the day. And the disciples became concerned. This is a deserted place and the hour is now late. Send the crowds away so that they may go into the villages and buy food for themselves. They want Jesus to understand the seriousness of the situation. They don't have enough to go around. And in fact, if all they have to feed themselves is five loaves of bread and two fish, then the 13 of them are not going to be fed very well that night. The disciples need for people to go take care of themselves for a while, but Jesus isn't going to let that happen. He's not finished with any of them. Neither the persons in the crowd nor the disciples just yet for their grieving also. They were the ones who had to bury the beheaded body of John the Baptist. A gruesome and a heartbreaking task. And now they might have asked themselves, what's to become of us if they can do this to John? But Jesus said, they need not go away. You give them something to eat. You give them something to eat. And if you remember the end of this particular reading, you remember that there are many people in the crowd to be fed. 
We sometimes get stuck on calling this the feeding of the 5,000. Well, the real numbers are much larger. Imagine the people that are there. The text says there were about 5,000 men besides women and children. And probably most men had at least one wife. Each wife would have had one or two or six or eight children and perhaps servants to go along with them. Commentators estimate the crowd at over 20,000. That's a lot of people, especially if you're a disciple who has just been asked to feed them from your little meager supply of food. And I think this story is great because we can put ourselves somewhere in that story. You might see yourself as a member of the crowd who's just been healed or one who's waiting to be healed. You might be one of the disciples who also needs time away and who's very aware of the meager supplies you carry along in, in your learning and your teaching times. The disciples operated out of a mindset not unlike most of ours. I think the dominant culture is not so different in many ways from the one that the disciples found themselves in that way. The world market is based on the insecurities of perceived scarcity. There might not be enough. Consumerism is, is fueled by fear and anxiety. Marketers depend on us feeling deprived. You deserve a break today. Go to McDonald's. You deserve to have this fancy car. You've earned it. We need something more, bigger, faster, newer, something more. And this can lead to anxiety and stinginess, even aggression toward others. We hoard things just in case. But Jesus is teaching us a different lesson today. The message is about finding abundance in our own available resources. Everybody in Jesus' community would eat plenty of fish and plenty of bread, common, ordinary food. When Jesus wanted to leave us a reminder of himself, as we will share in a few moments in communion, a good choice was bread, something that he broke many, many times with his friends and disciples and the enemies of the people. So Jesus invited the disciples to bring what they had, five loaves of bread and two fish. There's no little boy here. We don't know where the food came from. And he asked the entire crowd to sit down on the grass. He took the loaves and looked up to heaven and blessed and broke the loaves and he gave them to his disciples. And all ate and were filled. The disciples must have been amazed. And so too would have been the 20,000. However you believe the miracle occurred, Reverend Catherine Nelson, former pastor of Peace Church here in Duluth, does a ministry with um, prisoners. And so at the jail, she said she was talking about this story and asked the women that she was speaking with, what do you think happened? And one of the women said, well, the mamas brought snacks. So, so maybe that is how it is. What was perceived is not enough is now more than enough, is now abundance. The 12 disbelieving disciples called to share what they believed to be scarcity were each handed a basket full of abundance. 12 disciples, 12 baskets. It truly is a miracle story in a lot of ways. And maybe not a miracle just in all the food, but also a healing story. Maybe there's no less miracle in Jesus' actions, converting us from a habit of seeing the glass half empty to a higher vision of seeing the glass being half full. And to appreciate what we have, that, that we have a glass at all. Jesus used his powers to heal and then to feed the crowd, healing the spirits, filling their needs. We can expect God to be aware of and responsive to our needs, just like Jesus was in the needs of those people in his immediate area. We're also called to follow Jesus' example using our powers to meet the needs of the people that we meet, healing, feeding, listening, praying, loving. Amen. The sermon title that was selected for today um, in, in the lectionary readings is Face to Face. And I see face to face, obviously, 
in Jacob wrestling with a man, God, an angel. They were right there. You can't get much closer face to face than that. But also Jesus face to face with the evils of humanity, face to face with his disciples, face to face with the 5,000 plus women and children and healing them and touching them and praying over them. Face to face is where we can see into someone's soul, looking into their eyes and, and make a true connection with them. So our hymn is number 665, Break Now the Bread of Life. to this table. There's something for you here. And as long as I've been doing this and as often as I lead these communion services, whether they're on ball fields at church camp or beside the lake when we're baptizing babies or here in this congregation or in others, hospital bedsides, chaplaincy bedsides, so many places, there's something in it. There's something new. There's something different. There's an enlightenment that happens each time because we share we share stories we share about why we're there and what we need and, and um, who we are so you are invited to come Jesus at the table for all for all and we can share what's on our minds joys and concerns that we have brought with us today what would you share today yes I know I'm a day late, but it's my, it was my nephew. I have only one nephew, and he turned 29 yesterday, and he has a little girl who is 10 that he's trying to raise as a single dad. And just, um, just pray blessings upon him and his family as they mature and grow. And um, I just pray for his protection. It's a pretty hazardous job, so it's a firefighter. Well, congratulations on yet another birthday yeah, know, in your family. Time. You're so blessed to have people with with joyous stories to tell, with um, with tales of overcoming difficulties and and charging through. For all those who are celebrating birthdays or anniversaries, um, this is a great time. This is a wonderful time, and we give thanks to God for the gifts of life that are renewed in us on these days. Oh, God of love, in you hear our prayers. There's also sadness in the world. This week marks the two-year 
um, anniversary of the death of my mother, which was a struggling time for us in our family and continues to be. Um, and there are others who are ill, who are recovering, who are in slow processes, who are contemplating decisions that will have to be made about their futures and their future health care. So we pray for calm and consolation and vision in these times. Oh God, in your grace, you, you hear our, our prayers. prayers. We turn now to a community prayer time. I invite you to look again at the bulletins. There's a responsive um, prayer for us before we go into a time of silent prayer. In silence, in getting away from it all, we meet you, O oh God. In struggling to know what is right, we meet you, O oh God. In frustration, wondering, not knowing, we meet you, O oh God. In times of want and times of plenty, we meet you, O oh God. We bring all our feelings, all our questions, all our doubts, and all our hopes as we gather here in prayer. Hear us as we pray. God, we have invoked your name, we have told your stories, we have lifted up your grace. Be with us. Hear us when we call your name. Help us in our struggles. Listen when we whisper in the night and when we shout by day. God, help us with our fears. Comfort us when we are sad and when we are alone. God, be our friend. Hold us in your loving arms. Be with us always. We know you sent your son Jesus to be with us always. In human form for a time, in spirit with us always. You and Jesus Christ and the Holy Spirit hold us and meet our needs in so many varied ways. So help us to remember how we can be helpful and present in so many ways for your people. As we pray together the prayer that Jesus taught us saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Our words of assurance come to us from Psalm 145. The Lord is gracious and merciful, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love. The Lord is good to all. His compassion is over all that he has made. The Lord upholds all who are falling and raises up all who are bowed down. The eyes of all look to you and you give them their food in due season. You open your hand, satisfying the desire of every living thing. The Lord is just in all his ways, kind in all his doings. The Lord is near to all who call on him, to all who call on him in truth. He fulfills the desire of all who fear him. He also hears their cry and saves them. The Lord watches over all who love him, but the wicked he will destroy. My mouth will speak the praise of the Lord and all flesh will bless his holy name forever and ever. Amen.
Jesus fed the crowd with five loaves of bread and two fish. It was an amazing thing. It was an amazing thing. And the people were amazed and the disciples were amazed. And, and Jesus was, um, I think, pleased to have been able to show that miracle, however it occurred. Because Jesus had difficult times with his disciples. He had difficult times with people, with uh, um, political leaders, with the religious leaders, with those who he thought were his friends. And even his disciples, when they discouraged him from speaking or tried to counter what it was he was teaching. But he brought them all together for the night of the Passover meal when they came to remember God's saving the people of Israel from slavery in Egypt. In that meal, bread and cup are shared. And even though he knew he was to be betrayed, Jesus took the bread. And after giving thanks, he broke it and passed it to his disciples saying, take and eat all of you for this is my body, which will be broken for you. As often as you eat this, remember me. And in the same way, after supper, Jesus took the cup. It is a night of extravagance in the Passover meal, and there was plenty of wine, plenty of juice for them to share. It brings um, a glow, perhaps, to their faces, but a relaxed atmosphere to the people at the table. And it is sweetness, and it is refreshment to the people, as it was to the people of Israel. So Jesus took the cup. And after giving thanks, he passed it to his disciples and said, Drink this, all of you. This cup represents my blood, which will be poured out for you. It is for the forgiveness of your sins. It is the cup of the new covenant. Every time you drink this, remember me. So with bread and cup before us, we come to this table able to share in those gifts as well. Jesus could have prepared a banquet for the crowds. He could have had fruits and rich meats and great wines. Um, he gave them instead bread and fish. Very common. No one would have squabbled over that. Everyone probably would have been able to eat it. And every day they would have bread and they would have fish. And every day they would remember the miracle of the feeding of the 20,000. So let us pray. O oh God, consecrate us by your spirit. We also ask that you bless these gifts of bread and cup and bless us that as we receive these gifts at this table, we may offer you our faith and praise and be reunited with Christ and united with one another. Amen. So through the broken bread, we participate in the body of Christ. Eat this bread for it is the body of Christ broken for you. And through the cup of blessing, we participate in the new life that Christ gives. Drink this cup, for it also offers you forgiveness and a new covenant of new life. Come for all things are ready.
and Jesus had 12 baskets of leftovers. Maybe it was because people were generous. Maybe there truly was just a plain out miracle of, of an abundance made from what seemed like scarcity. And maybe, just maybe, the baskets were filled because the mamas brought snacks. And so each of the baskets was filled with abundance, with the good things that Jesus had brought, with the sharing of the people around the table. God, we thank you because we have nothing else to say. We thank you because of all the life you have given, all the love you have given, all the blessings you have given, all the abundance you have given, and the trust that you have in us to share our scarcity and turn it into abundance for your people in the world. Amen. So to share, a suggestion for the Union Gospel Mission this month is personal hygiene products, combs, brushes, nail clippers, um, feminine products, um, deodorants, face, face spell, um, moisturizer, hand lotion, soaps, whatever you got, whatever you got, the people need it. So how do people who are without hear these words from Isaiah? Is it with hope? Oh, everyone who thirsts, come to the waters. You that have no money, come buy and eat. Come buy wine and milk without money and without price. Why do you spend your money for that which is not bread and your labor for that which does not satisfy? Listen carefully to me and eat what is good and delight yourselves in rich food. Incline your ear and come to me. Listen so that you may live. I will make with you an everlasting covenant, my steadfast, sure love for David. See, I made him a witness to the peoples, a leader and commander of the peoples. See, you shall call nations that you do not know. And nations that do not know you shall run to you because of the Lord your God, the Holy One of Israel. He has glorified you. That little light that we can shine can be seen by nations and certainly by individuals who are in need because we have. Out of gratitude, let us sing our doxology. prayer of consecration of these gifts. God of increase and bounty, source of all good things, we offer these gifts as a portion of that which you have given to us. May these gifts be as loaves and fishes for those who might find themselves in poverty or hunger. May this act of giving bring about change, change in our lives, change in the lives we touch, and change in the systems that harm through Jesus, who gave so much to save so many. Amen. You wonder why attendance is down in churches. I was struck this morning as I came down Woodland Avenue, there were three different baseball fields and all three of them were full of people playing ball at 8.30 on Sunday mornings. <laughs> Why aren't they in church? Because baseball looks better on your college grad or your college application fee. Okay, but we, <laughs> wherever we are, and even they, will be sent forth by God's blessing as Jacob was, as the 20,000 people on the hillside were. Um, hymn number 712. <laughs>
And let's leave one another from this time of worship and prayer and song as we go into the world. We know we have met God face to face because we have, we have received, received abundance from little and we have seen the ordinary shining with blessing. We know we have met God face to face because we have been empowered to share abundantly from the few loaves or the many gifts we have been given. We know we have met God face to face because we have been inspired to proclaim the blessings we received from the love of friends and family. We go out together to show others the face of God in words and acts of service and witness and forgiveness. Amen.